Good evening. Welcome to our Bible study this evening where we will be continuing with our Anderson Jubilee. This evening, our guest pastors will be Reverend Jerry Mannery from our sister church, We Are One. So grab your Bibles and join in with us as we celebrate God's word this evening. Amen. Amen.
mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. Awesome. Awesome. Get him out. God is holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and happy Jubilee Wednesday. For in times like these, there is a word. And I would like to thank Pastor May uh, for this blessed privilege to bring that word. Thomas Wolfe famously said, you can't go home. But with me, Pastor May proved him wrong and I'm glad to be here on today. You know, a wreck of any kind is a terrifying experience. For this, an Amtrak derailment, an, an automobile, a motorcycle, motorcycle accident, or an airplane crash. Uh, but probably the most terrifying wreck of all is a shipwreck because of the prolonged agony that the passenger and the crew must endure. Whereas all of the other wrecks are over with within a matter of seconds, uh, minutes, and hour, a shipwreck can go on for days. And although the sinking of the Titanic has been popularized and, and fictionalized in books and on film for posterity, the most famous shipwreck in history is found in Acts, the 27th chapter, verses 1 through 44. It's one of the best told, most detailed account in history, and certainly the most profitable for the hearers and the readers. I have used this account as the basis for today's message and entitled it, You Can Make It on Broken Pieces. My master text is found in Acts 27, verses 39 through 44, and I read, When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchor, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudder. Then they hoisted the four sails to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern were broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land, get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached, sand, reached land safely. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And before we dive into the word, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, on this day, we just thank you for being our God and what a mighty God you are. And Lord, we just thank you for uh, all of the blessings that you continue to pour out upon us, Lord. Lord, you are so faithful, even though we are faithless. And we just bless you, Lord. And Lord, your word tells us in all our ways to acknowledge you and you will direct our path. And Lord, and we know that if we would just follow your lead, we would end up in a place of success. And Lord, and I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, you are. Have your way this day. And I just pray that the seeds that are sown would produce harvest, a harvest 36 to 100 times what was sown. I ask this in Jesus' name, the only name that matters. Amen. Amen. Has there ever been a time in your walk with the Lord that you knew that you were in his will 
when you knew that you was walking in faith and obedience to his will, and yet you found yourself in the midst of a storm and a shipwreck. In our text today, the Apostle Paul found himself not in just a storm and a shipwreck, but this was his fourth shipwreck, having spent a day and a night in the open seas. And so Acts 27 tells us what led to this particular shipwreck. Paul had been accused by the, the Jewish leaders of being a troublemaker, of stirring up riots among the Jews, and, and being a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, even accused him of trying to desecrate the temple. His accusers wanted him tried before the Sanhedrin council, but knowing he would not get a fair trial, Paul took advantage of his Roman citizenship and appealed for a change of venue to Caesar's court in Rome, and his request was granted. In Acts 27, 1, we are told that when the departure date was set for Paul to sail to Italy, he and a few other uh, prisoners were placed on the, under the supervision of a centurion by the name of Julius, a member of the Imperial Regiment, an elite guard. And after boarding the ship from Arinthium, at, at they set sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. For those in the world, it can rightly be said that misery loves company. But for those in Christ, in the midst of misery, God provides company. And he provided Paul with the company of Luke, the writer of the gospel, and with fellow disciple at Mistachius to accompany him to Rome. When they landed at, at Myra in Lycia, Julius the Centurion found an, an Egyptian cargo ship that was sailing to Italy, and he put uh, Paul and his traveling companion and the others on board, he put them aboard the cargo ship. My dear friend, Dr. David Malapo from Johannesburg, South Africa, has famously said that things don't go wrong, they start wrong. And this voyage got off to the wrong footing. The part in Myra, they reached nearby Sinaitis only with great difficulty. And when the wind would not allow them to keep their course, they moved along the coast to a place called Fairhaven. And upon leaving Fairhaven, it literally went from fair to all hell breaking loose as all the forces of nature came together against them. I'm an old uh, Navy guy, and during my days uh, in the Sixth Fleet aboard the USS Columbus, we, uh, we made annual trips to the Mediterranean. And we went to countries like Italy and, and Spain, Greece, uh, Portugal, France, Gibraltar, Crete, Turkey, Morocco, and others. And we always did these tours before September because after September, the weather in the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic became very unpredictable. And we're told in verse 9 that sailing had already become dangerous because now it was after the fast or after the Day of Atonement, which means that it was after October. Paul, who had already experienced three shipwrecks, tried warning Julius and the captains of the ship that this was not the best time to sail, that the voyage was going to be disastrous and that it was going to bring great loss to the ship, to the cargo, and to the passengers. Although there is no profit in gaining the whole world and losing your soul, the world always put profits and personal purposes above people. And sure enough, instead of listening to Paul's prophecy, they overruled him and set sail to make up for lost time to be able to make their delivery date. Sometimes we get ourselves in st into storms for the same reason, out of impatience, accepting expert advice that is contrary to God's will, following the majority and trusting condition that seems ideal. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they just knew that the gods were smiling upon them. So they lifted anchor and set sail along the coast of Crete. But they soon discovered that the gentle south wind was just to come before the storm. It was not long before Paul's prophecy was proven right. For no sooner were they out to sea that a gale force wind, the infamous Northeaster, a macro-tropical cyclone struck. 
they lost all control of the ship and it was like a dry cork out in the midst of an angry ocean. They took such a violent battering from the storm that they began throwing cargo and the ship's rigging overboard to try to lighten the load. You know, a, a storm on land is a terrible and frightening experience to go through. But there's nothing quite like a storm out on life's ocean to remind us just how fragile life is. These storms have a particular way of revealing what's essential and what's not, what needs to stay on board and what needs to get thrown overboard. I learned years ago how to determine essential things, and this is it in a nutshell. Things that we can calmly reflect upon while we're on our deathbed. Everything else can be thrown overboard. Everything else is non-essential. And so in verse 20, we're told that the conditions would, co would continue to go from bad to worse and now to desperate. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued, we are told that the, the crew finally gave up hope of being saved. And that's a bad situation to be in. It's been said that a crisis does not make a person. A crisis reveals what a person is made out of. And it did just that with the Apostle Paul. He began the voyage as a prisoner on the ship. But from verse 21 onward, he became the commander. And as huge waves were assaulting the ship, Paul's soul was as calm as a windless pond. You might ask the question, why was Paul so calm? It's because his, his soul was anchored in the Lord. And when we are anchored in, in God's presence, we would display amazing courage to encourage the discouraged. And after gently rebu rebuking them for not following his advice, Paul told them that everything was going to be all right. All they had to do was stay with the ship. And that's all we have to do as well in this corona storm. Stay with the ship. He told them that the night before an angel of God, he, of the God he served, assured him that not one person would be lost, only the ship, and that they would make it to shore safely. That he had faith in God and believed that it would happen just as his God said. The angel of God still speaks, still speaks with a promise to us in the storm. The problem is we're just not still enough to be able to hear his still small voice that's still speaking through us to his Holy Spirit and through his Holy Word. In a recent Sunday school uh, class at, my, at We Are One, uh, we talked about and had a, a subject that's living with hope in a broken world. We learned that hope is confident expectation and moral certainty that the good we expect and that we desire for the future would be done based on the faithfulness and promises of God and his word through his son, Jesus Christ. Many of us know the promises of God and yet we are ready to give up because the storm seems too fierce. And because of the storm clouds, we can't see the hand of God moving on our behalf. But with Christ as our hope of glory, in him we have a lifeboat with a life vest with a lifeguard on duty. Now that's good news and a good word in times like these. Another thing about a storm and trouble is that it's an appetite suppressor. It causes us to lose our appetite. You know, we can, we can have a full meal sitting on the table and then all of a sudden we get a registered uh, letter from the IRS and we lose our appetite. We get a call from the doctor's office after having tests ran and we lose our appetite. We get a pink slip from our job and we lose our appetite. And because of the constant suspense and concern about their outcome, it caused these sailors to lose their appetite for 14 days. So Paul pleaded with them to eat in order to regain their strength for what was ahead. He gave them a promise of assurance that not only would their life not be lost, 
but not one of the hairs on their head would be. And after he said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. This kind of sounded like he was having communion. And Paul uh, was a brother that walked to talk. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, he wrote, Give thanks in all situations, for this is the will of God for you. And here in the book of Acts, his action matched his words. He gave thanks to God in the middle of this macro tropical cyclone. Paul trusted God and could thank him for their safe harbor uh, while still in the midst of the storm. You know, we don't have to wait till the battle is over in order to thank God. He didn't tell us that we would not go through things, but he said while we're in them, we could give him praise and glory because he's worthy. We can thank him while in the eye of the storm because as those in Christ, we know that the eye is his eye, the same eye that's on the sparrow, and the same eye that watches over you and me. Oh, we can thank God, y'all. And after thanking God, he broke bread and began to eat. And, and as they ate, they were all encouraged by Paul's courage, and they ate the bread themselves. Like these sailors, we too lose appetites in the midst of storm, in the midst of trials and tribulation, in the midst of troubles. Our soul goes weeks without feasting on the bread of life, the word of God, and then wonder why we are so weak. Now, as you today, have you eaten today? The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, that we were created with three basic parts a spirit, a soul, and a body. Whichever one goes unfed will be the weakest. And although we cannot live by bread alone, we show sure try to. And in the midst of COVID-19, we need as much strength as possible. Strength that we can only receive through the nourishment of God's word. Only it can strength and sustain us in this storm. And there are five ways that we can feast on God's word. We can read it. We can study it. We can hear it. We can meditate on it. And we can tell it. Indeed, we are what we eat. In John 6, 35, Jesus declared that I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And true to form, when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship uh, even more by uh, throwing the grain into the sea. This lets us know that we no longer need the grain once we've eaten the bread of life. It's amazing that after 14 days of neither sun nor stars and the storm continuously raging, verse 39 tells us that after obeying the, uh, the command of the man of God, all of a sudden daylight came and they saw a bay with a sandy beach, and they decided to run the ship up on it. But the ship hit a sandbar before reaching it, and it ran aground. And with the front of the ship stuck in the sandbar, the back of the ship took a pounding from the sea surf, and it was broken to pieces. The only thing those on board could do was jump into the water and to make it to shore. The soldiers became concerned about their prisoners for if the prisoners escaped, the soldiers were held accountable and could be killed themselves. But the centurion who wanted to spare Paul kept them from harming anyone. Paul had favor with the centurion because of God's promise that had been, been fulfilled that the gospel would go to Rome. And because of Paul's favor, others were saved. We should never underestimate the favor on our lives that could lead to the salvation of others. We have to know and believe that despite the storms in our lives, if God gives us a promise, he will show us favor in the midst of it all until that promise has been fulfilled. Oh, God is so faithful. And as the ship broke apart, the order went out to those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the broken ship. 
In this way, everyone reach, will reach land safely. You know, several months ago, we were cruising right along. We were getting ready for spring break and Easter, just coming out of Mardi Gras, getting ready for summer vacation, wedding plans, Essence Festival, and major sports events. But then the COVID-19 storm suddenly hit. And now all of a sudden we're experiencing brokenness. Brokenness in our ship, our fellowship, our worship, our discipleship, our relationship, our courtship, our partnership, our scholarship, our ownership, our musicianship, and our championships. And now we find ourselves in waters over our head without the ability to swim, with undertow below, moving in different directions, in situations that have left us with just broken pieces. But in times like these, there is a word. The hope of glory, the confident expectation and moral certainty that the good we expect and desire for the future will be done based on the faithfulness and the promise of God in his, and his word through his son, Jesus Christ. This would keep us afloat. It would get us safely to shore. And I say to you on today, this Jubilee Wednesday, hold on because you can make it on broken pieces. God says, even in your brokenness, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hold on, he says, for my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Hold on. You can make it on broken pieces. Because, see, those who hope is in the, nor in the, whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like an eagle. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not faint. Hold on. The Lord is with you, and he is mighty to save. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives on our inside. Hold on. You can make it on broken pieces. And the word says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, says the Lord. For in times like these, there is a word. And God's word reminds us that Moses' speech was broken, but that didn't stop him. God used him to, to deliver his people out of bondage. You can make it on broken pieces. Esther came from a, uh, from a broken home, but that didn't stop her. God raised her up to become the queen of Persia and used her in a time such as then to save his people. You can make it on broken pieces. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish, blessed it and broke it and fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, and had 12 baskets left over. You can make it on broken pieces. The Lord is near them that of a broken heart, the word tells us, and save those of a contrite spirit. The ultimate reason I know that we can make it on broken pieces is because on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. In brokenness, he was wounded for our transgression. In brokenness, he was bruised for our iniquities. In brokenness, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And in brokenness, by his stripes, we are healed. Hold on for dear life and don't let go because you can make it on broken pieces. Situations in your life right now, it might not be whole. But I say to you, hold on. You can make it on broken pieces. The security that comes from God is not, is not based on our wholeness. But it's based on his word, for it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit that we are made whole. Real security 
comes only from our hope in God, from looking to the hills from whence cometh our help, because all of our help comes from the Lord. In the midst of this pandemic, it is this security of faith that we need to examine more closely in our lives. In time like these, there is a word. Only two things can happen to us, those of us who are in the Lord. Only what God permits and only what God ordains. Hold on. Stay in the race and keep the faith because you can make it on broken pieces. And so be it and amen. And today, if you're in a storm and you've given up all hope of being saved, I come today to tell you that to the utmost, Jesus saves. The word that saved is right here, as near as the tongue in your mouth, as near as the heart in your chest. It's the word of faith that welcomed God to go to work and to set things right between you and he. And this is the core of our preaching, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you have received the hope of glory. You will get through the storm, and that's it. Again, I would just thank you all for this time to come before you on today. I would just like to encourage you again that you can make it on broken pieces. May God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and turn to his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen.